The American Beauty Tim uses was made by Robust Tools. All our lays have a seven year warranty. Our tool wrists feature a hardened rod on top. Lots of sizes to fit your lathe. Robust, because the making matters. Thompson Lay Tools. Welcome to a new level of professional wood turning tools. Made by a wood turner for wood turners. Today on Wood Turning, we're going to make this beautiful pendant. And on top of that, we're going to show you how to dye your wood so you can make all these different colors. This is the fun part. Watch this pop out as I go. There's the one. And let's put this little piece of wood in there and you can see how the tenon fits in. Make one more pass on the edge here. Make sure I have a nice clean cut with requires very little sanding. And you can see the fine shavings I'm taking right there. This is a nice fine cut. Most people think I look better with the mask on than with it off, by the way. Now you see how the black works as an undercoat to actually show off the red color. Now before we color the pendant, we actually have to make one out of wood. And a buddy of mine, Bruce Holden, came up with this idea and he was showing me how he dyes the wood to make these beautiful colors. Then he adds a little bit of jewelry uh, doohickeys there and then puts a chain on it and he sells those at craft shows. It's a really nice quick project, um, but you need to make them out of wood, right? Well, we have some figured maple here and that's very important. When you're picking the wood for this project, you want something that has some figures, some lines in it. Uh, if you look at this, you can see some streaking going this way. This wood has a lot of beauty in it. Now, you see these holes. Well, Bruce had a really slick idea. I was thinking you'd take a little tiny piece of wood like this, cut it out on the bandsaw, stick it on the lathe and turn it. No, that's way too slow. <laughs> what Bruce did was he goes to his drill press and he has a two and a half inch hole saw right there. Now we have to be safety conscious, so we're going to take a clamp now and put it on here and tighten this wood because we want to hold this on the drill press before we drill because it's going to want to twist because that's a big cut you're going to make with that big uh, drill, what do you call that again? Hole saw. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't had enough coffee this morning. Anyway, so I also want to take a clamp here and I want to see where this is going to come down to real quick. Okay, so that's kind of meeting up about where I want it. I'm going to fudge this a little bit once I get going on it. So bring that in there, clamp her good. Now I've stopped the rotation and it's not going to flip on me either. But one of the neat things that Bruce does is you can see by looking right next door here, he's got a hole here. Well, by cutting out like this and cutting the edge out, you have more room for the sawdust to come out so you don't clog this tool up while you're cutting. It's a much easier cut. So that's all in place. Let's give that a shot. We're gonna feed it in slowly. And there's a lot of torque on this when it gets going, so you gotta take your time. There we go. It would also help if I didn't have my uh, <laughs> drill press set on a low setting. Doesn't have a lot of torque right now. There we go, now we're cutting good. And I'm just gonna bottom this out. See if I can do this without covering the camera. There we go. You can see how all that sawdust is ejecting out of there though. I don't have to lift this up to clear it out, do I? So that's as deep as I can go right there. Cool. So. That's the first stage in the process of getting those blanks out. Now I want to make my discs about three eighths of an inch thick and you can see I have some handy lines here because <laughs> Bruce already did some cutting on this blank that he loaned me. So I'm just going to take my pencil and use the lead part, that'd be handier, there we go, and just draw it like so. I'm just going to then put my hand up here again. He said he can get about two blanks doing this and you don't want to push it because if you wind up trying to cut out that little bitty blank there, you might lose some wood. And we're all into saving our wood if possible, aren't we? So I'm going to turn on the bandsaw. I've got my uh, guide raised to the right height. So we're going to bring this in here. And this is the fun part. Watch this pop out as I go. Mm -hmm. 
There's one. <laughs> Come back over here. Here comes this number two. There we go. Now the next step is we want to make one of these sides flat because we're going to have to attach this to the lathe and we're going to use double sticky tape to do that. So we want this bottom, this is going to be the bottom, to be finished before we move any further. So I'm going to turn my lathe on and this is an MDF board that you've seen before probably and it has a piece of sandpaper 80 grit on there right now. Now you want to hold on to this carefully. Don't put your fingers that far or you'll wind up with stubby fingers because that is 80 grit after all. But just lightly hold this up here. And we're going to flatten the bottom. And that's nice and smooth. And actually, it's a pretty good finish. I'm going to pop a little bit of 220 grit on here in a second and make it a little shinier. But that's the process. Flatten the bottom. And then we'll move on to the next step. Now, I've mounted a little piece of wood in here. It's just about two inches wide and probably about three inches long. And I guarantee you, you have dozens of these hanging around your shop like I do. Never throw anything away, right? Because you're going to need it for something sooner or later. And what I'm going to make here is a mounting device to hold the blanks of wood that I'm going to make the pendants from. So I'm just taking my roughing gouge and I'm moving my body with the tool and just making a nice straight cut. This isn't fine art or really <laughs> science at this point. We're just making a little gizmo that we can use in the shop. So I've got that roughed out. Now I'm going to grab ooh, Mr. Parting Tool here. And I want to make a tenon on here to go into my chuck jaws. And I know that the chuck jaws are about an inch and a half wide when they close down. So I've got that marked right there. I'm going to take my parting tool up here with one hand, start to cut, and I'm going to rest the calipers are right there. And when the calipers pass across, that means I'm at the right diameter. So if you push a little hard, it'll catch sometimes. And that's okay. That means I'm a little bit fat of where I need to be, which is okay with me. I don't want to be too thin because you can't put wood back on. Anyway, I'm going to put about a 3 8 of an inch tenon on here because I'm not going to be putting a lot of pressure on this, but I do want to make sure that it holds really well. So I'll go get my one specialty tool that I own, and that's my big old uh, parting tool that I made at an angle, so it matches the angle inside my dovetail jaws. I'm just going to push it in, make a cut, and you can see how it's forming that tenon now. So that's a little dovetail tenon that's going to fit perfectly in my jaws and give me a really good grip. I've got my chuck on the lathe now, and let's put this little piece of wood in there, and you can see how the tenon fits in. And I'm going to clamp down on that. And this is a nice fit. There's not a lot of gap in there, so it means it's a good, strong grab. Most of this metal is touching the wood. So we get that on there. One little thing I need to do just yet is I want to flatten the end right there because that's where we're going to be attaching our pendant blanks. And it needs to be perfectly flat so we get a good contact with the wood when we stick it to the tape. Anyway, I'll go back to Mr. Parting Tool. Nothing's hitting, nothing's touching. Turn this back on. And I'm going to bring the speed up just a little bit. When you're doing uh, spindle turning, speed really helps. <laughs> if you go too slow, it's just kind of like cutting through molasses. So anyway, I'm laying the tool right, right on the bevel and come down like so. Coming right through the middle here. And I'm pushing the tool into the side like this, and that helps me get a nice straight cut. At least, supposedly. We'll see how it looks when I do this. If I take this up, look, that's nice and flat. If there's any gap between this and the wood, it's in the center. So that means they're gonna be touching on the edges, which is the perfect thing. Now, what I want to do, we'll turn this off. One of my favorite little tools to have in the shop, that's not really a tool, but it's a thing, is double stick tape. It's not like masking tape, but it's also not like scotch tape. It's in between on the thickness. But it is beautiful for mounting small things on the lathe. So we're gonna take this sticky part, and put it right on there and push that in with our hand, make good contact. And just to be neat, we're going to go ahead and take the scissors and trim off the excess. Because that'd be flapping around while we're turning and then that'd just be messy. <laughs> and well, Lord knows we don't like mess, do we? Anyway, the next thing I want to do though is to first off ask myself why I trim my fingernails today and then try to peel off the other side of <laughs> the two-sided tape. Once I have that done, we'll, we'll move forward. 
Jeez. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, now we can take the blank and stick it onto the tape. We could just slap it on like that, but when we start cutting the edges here to clean it up, it could pop off. So I'm gonna use my tailstock as a support for that, and in the tailstock, I'm gonna put a live center. The only problem is my live center has this hunkin' big point in it, right? Well, it's gonna stick a hole right into our beautiful pendant. We don't want that. So we're gonna take an Allen wrench right here, and we can undo that, loosen that tip, and just hide it right inside. Isn't that neat? Just tuck it in there. So now what's gonna to touch on the wood is going to be this cone part so it distributes the force a little bit more and it won't make as big a mark and to minimize that even more i have chamois cloth that i keep in my shop at all times and it's the stuff you use to wash your car with right and dry it off well i just cut myself a little tiny piece of it that'll go right on there and that'll give me a little more buffer so we'll just get some of this stuff out of the way and we will now mount our little blank on here bring that up got my little chamois right there so anyway, just take this up and just kind of eye it in. You don't have to be precise with putting this on here. However, if you're going to do like two dozen of these a day or something like that, you might want to build yourself a little jig that will help you get these a little more centered a little faster. But since we're only doing one or two today, that's not that important. So I'll push that on there. That tape still holds really well. And bring the tailstock up. Put our little bumper guard on there. <laughs> Lock this down and advance the quill. That's this thing, it goes this way, up to the wood, and just put a light amount of pressure on there. Now with this tape, ideally they say hold it for six seconds with pressure, and then it's great. So we look good there, that looks good there. I want to grab my little swept back spindle gouge. This is going to be really handy. This is like a bowl blank on here. The grain is running towards me. So if I came in here and started cutting like this, uh, in that direction, there's no grain supporting the cut. I'm gonna have to come across like this for the grain to be supported because, well, actually I'm gonna come across like this from left to right because I'm gonna push into here and these fibers are being cut cleanly because they're being pushed into the fibers here on out to here. Now, watch as I do this and I'll show you a little bit of the tear out. And that's a little out round, but that's not bad. So anyway, okay, I've got the tool into my hip. I've got the bevel aimed the direction I wanna go, like so. My body's locked in and the tool's turned off right there, see? If I turn the tool a little bit over, now it's turned on, it makes a nice cut. So I'm just leaning my body into this. Now watch what happens right here. I'm going to stop this. This is a good example of what the unsupported grains look like. So you can see right here, see how it's chipping out and tearing out? There's little fibers right here. You can see those? That's the grain that's not supported and it's not a clean cut. But that's okay. I'm going to get rid of that in just a second. So I'm going to make one more pass on the edge here, make sure I have a nice clean cut with it requires very little sanding. And you can see the fine shavings I'm taking right there. There's a nice fine cut. Now, technically, if I come in here now and go this way, it's an unsupported cut. And you can hear the chatter because those fibers are fighting me, right? Well, I can do that because I'm gonna come back and make the proper cut in just a second and clean that up. What I'm trying to do right now is make a nice curve or a dome to the pendant because when you color the wood, or even when you're trying to show any grain on wood, a curved surface looks a whole lot nicer than a flat surface. It, it shines off better. The light hits it and you see the ripples in the wood. So I've made that cut. Now it might be a little torn up on the grain, but this is why I like the swept back gouge. See this edge right here? I'm gonna use this edge, bring it up here, put it on its edge, and I'm gonna pull it back like so. You can see the nice little shavings that are coming off of there. I'm gonna come back, do it one more time. And what this is doing is taking a nice clean cut and it's getting rid of any of the torn grain that I might have done by moving the wood out going the wrong direction. So you can see now, I can't get to the center where that is right there where I have the chamois, but that's okay because we're going to sand that nub off and that'll give us our dome. And that's looking, ooh, that's looking really nice. Okay, now I've reduced the speed of the lathe because I don't want to get the wood too hot. When it gets this in, you can crack it or you can actually burn the wood and leave a mark it's going to be really hard to get out but all i'm doing is taking that part that i didn't turn and making a nice curved dome blending it into the part that i did turn and you notice my sandpaper is folded i have it in thirds like that so i cut it out in that shape and then i fold it like so because it's easier to handle this little bit of wood i mean a little bit of sandpaper but yeah, i get to get two fingers into it i pinch it like that it doesn't run out of my hands 
So I sand through the grits. I started with 150 here. My next grit's going to be 220. And what I like to do is take my hand just like that and knock off any of the dust I just made. That way when I put this piece of sandpaper up there, it's going to touch wood. It's not touching dust. And if I touch dust right away, it would clog the paper almost immediately. So I'm moving my hand the whole time too. I'm not holding really firmly on it. I want to keep it moving all the time. If your fingers start to burn, you're pushing too hard and you're not moving the sandpaper enough or you had the lathe running too fast. Could be the trifecta in some cases and you could be doing all three. <laughs> and I'm moving it quickly on the edge. If I hold still on here, that will burn the edge. Ooh, that's feeling nice and smooth. This is my last grit, 320. And this is very, very fine dust, right? So you might not be able to hear it, but in the background I have a HEPA filter running. Obviously you can see I have my surgeon's mask on. I look very attractive in that. Most people think I look better with the mask on than with it off, by the way. <clears throat> anyway, okay, now we're almost ready to start moving to the fun part of the process, but let me see if I can get this off of here. This is the fun part because this tape <laughs> is really strong, right? So we're gonna put, oh, that actually came off okay. There you see it peeling off. Nice thing is you can use this tape for probably, for probably about 12 more discs before you have to change it. And that's a really cool return. But look how pretty that is. You can already see the reflections in the wood. And once we put the dye on there, oh, that's going to be dynamite. I promise this won't hurt a bit. <laughs> when it comes to dyes, dyes dye things. So they will dye you too. So you better have gloves on. Um, there's lots of different dyes, and I'm going to talk about those as we go. But one thing that uh, Bruce found out is you have to get in touch with your feminine side a little bit to do this. The best thing he found for applying uh, the dye are these makeup wedges. These are called wonder wedges, by the way. Nice name, huh? But these take just enough of the dye, and then it puts it in the sponge so you can put it exactly where you want it, which is an important thing when we're working with things that can dye everything on Earth, and it won't come out. Well, until your skin grows and leaves you. But anyway, so this stuff either comes pre-mixed or it comes, I get in there, <laughs> I'm scared of it. Uh, or you can buy it in powders. Um, the neat thing is there are water-based, there's also alcohol-based. There's different reasons for those. Alcohol-based dries faster. Water-based will raise the grain but the neat thing about water base is you have a lot more colors to choose from. Now, one thing I didn't do today because it would have taken a little more time is once you sand the back of this piece, go ahead and put some sanding sealer on it because you can see how the black is bleeding in. If you put the sanding sealer on there first, the black won't go into the back. But if that's a problem for you, just go ahead and black the back at the same time, and then this will be the back side of the pendant, and no one's going to care. It looks like you did it on purpose, right? <laughs> but... Black is a very important color when you do coloring because you need a base coat on there that's going to go into the fibers of the wood and some of the highlights of the wood is harder, the wood's harder than other parts of the wood. And, that, and that's how this works because you know how the end grain of a piece of wood will soak up uh, your, sand, your sealer that you're trying to keep the uh, water from escaping. It just soaks it up like crazy on the end grain and then the side grain just rejects it. Well what you're trying to do here on a burl, on a wild piece of wood, some of that's going to soak it up. You can see it looks kind of dry and flat in spots and shiny in spots. Where it's shiny, that wood's harder and it's not absorbing as much as of the ink or the dye. I mean. And where it's softer, it's really soaking in there. So what I want to do is get a good liberal helping on there. Now, to make, whoops, let me do the edges on this too. To make life a lot easier, uh, and also probably to make this die set even better because a lot of these dies were developed for clothes You actually want to heat uh, treat the wood now. It helps dry the die and it also uh, Helps to set the die so it's going to be a lot stronger and stay in there a lot longer Now all I do. Oh, there it is over here You can just buy a heat gun from any old place, you know, uh, you don't have to have a fancy one uh, You could use your hair dryer I don't have one anymore, uh, but it wouldn't get quite as hot as you need. So you want to do this and put the heat on here until these become toasty. And then you can tell also some of the shine will go away and when the shine goes away, you know you've also gotten out all the moisture. Now I'm using an alcohol-based black here, but I'm going to use water-based colors after this. 
So once this dries, we're on to our next step. Now that you put all that color on there, you want to remove about 60 to 80% of it. And you can hand sand these, which is fine, but I like to use equipment to help me out. If it can plug in and help me, that's great because I don't have to work as hard. But I want to remove some of the uh, uh, black out of it. So I'm exposing, you can see the white of the wood again. That's where the next color is going to go and that's how we get our differences. And you can see, that's what I was talking about, hard and soft. The soft wood kept the ink in it, the dye in it. The hard wood, it didn't go in deep enough, so that's what I'm sanding off. And when you look at this, it's got some really neat figure into it, doesn't it? Let me turn that on one more time and take a little bit more off. I am wearing breathing protection again because in addition to the sawdust that you're getting off of here, the inks, since they're powdered, they're dry now. Well, they're pretty nasty too if you get them in your lungs. And when you're doing this, by the way, don't worry if you take off too much uh, dye because you can always put dye back on. That's no big deal. But you can see this has some beautiful striping on it, so I think we're going to wind up with a really neat effect. Pop that off there. Still using the same piece of tape. Don't need this anymore. <laughs> Scared you, didn't I? Okay, let's go over here. Now we're going to go for our next color. This is layer number two. You can stop at layer number two if you want. Let me get some of the dust off of this. I can always wash these jeans later. <laughs> um, let me get new gloves too because if you get the black ink on your gloves or the dye, it will maybe bleed into the next ink you're using. Even though it's dried, it can, uh, with the water basically, it reactivate it a little bit because you haven't heat treated it on your gloves. So again, this is not going to hurt. So let's go for, let's go for red. This is really cool. These are water-based at this point, and you can get, oh, I mean, dozens, ugh, dozens of colors in the water base. And so it's up to you to figure out what colors you want to use and what looks you want. One thing that Bruce did that I was really impressed with, he built himself a storyboard on the maple that he uses to make his pendants with. And look at all the different colors he has on here. So he now knows when he's looking at that dark bottle that actually he's got this color instead of this color. And that makes a big difference when you're trying to mix all your colors. Another thing to remember is when you were in school, okay, uh, red and yellow make what? Green, I think. Uh, so you can actually blend the colors to make different colors. And back to my little swab here. We're going to go for some red right now. There we go. And we're going to put that on there. Woo! That is beautiful looking, isn't it? That is neat. Now you see how the black works as an undercoat to actually show off the red color. So get that in there really good like so. With um, water-based dyes, I'm going to get another little sponge here. We're going to go with this golden honey amber, I think is what it's called. Uh, you can actually control the saturation level of the colors better than you can with the alcohol base. So in other words, you can make this lighter, darker by how you mix the powders. And you're just mixing them with water. And I don't have those here because they're really messy. <laughs> I let Bruce do all that hard work. So that looks really nice. So now you can see the different colors we're getting. You can also see that grain starting to pop out. So I'm going to do the same thing I did a minute ago. And I'm going to dry them, sand them, and we'll go for our final color. Now I'm sanding our second coat down, and you can see I'm, I'm doing specific sanding. See, I'm bringing a line there. I'm trying to make some effects with this. I'm trying to expose the wood. I'm leaving some of the red, but you can actually remove wood or a complete color by sanding on the edge. I'm using 400 grit sandpaper now. So we're making a very smooth surface, and you can see I've already sanded this one. So let me get the dust off of this and the dust off of this. You'll be much neater than me when you're doing it. So let's go for a blue color, and we're going to use it on the yellow, like so. Now you can see the green coming out, see? Okay, it's blue and yellow makes green. I didn't figure this out one of these days. But anyway, it might look a little dull right now, but that's simply because 
it's soaking in and it's dry. Once we dry this and sand it again, it's really gonna pop. But once we've done that too, let me get some of the honey amber here. This is really cool stuff. This is what I love. Honey amber on the wood looks spectacular. It has such a cool color. And you can see how it's blending in with the red. That's really nice. And look at the blacks pop. That's really cool. But anyway, once we get this dried and we sand it one more time, we will start putting our finish on it and the accessories to make it into a piece of jewelry. Okay, I'm back from my paint booth. I was outside. <laughs> and I was using some sanding sealer for the first coat on these. And it starts to bring out the uh, grain a little bit. You can see it ripple now. Isn't that kind of cool? A couple coats of that, and you can sand or buff that in between. Then the last thing you want to put on there is a polyurethane finish, but we'll get to that in a second. The reason I'm showing you how to make pendants is because of the coloring part. Because look at what else you can do with the coloring. This is some of Bruce's work, and he's been going whole hog at this thing. And you can see how it really accentuates the wood. I mean, that's beautiful. This piece, unfortunately, took a trip off of his shelf at a craft show, so it's cracked. But it's a great example of a burl and how it's dark and light. He used just one color here to highlight all that. And you can use everyday items like a pepper grinder or a salt grinder. And you can see he put pink in there and yellow and stuff like that. And then over here, look at the figure on this wood. If you didn't have this on here, you wouldn't see that figure as much and it really highlighted it. It's beautiful looking. That's what's so fun about using dyes to color your wood because you can take something with a little bit of figure in it and really pop it and make it spectacular. Now to finish the spectacular on these, like I said, a couple coats on these and then you're gonna wanna get yourself some wipe on poly and a paper towel. And I'll load this up just a little bit. Whoa, that's loaded. Okay. These are a few I did earlier. They have their two coats on there. And you simply hand wipe the poly on here. This is when you see the beauty of the wood. Isn't that incredible? Now, I'm going to have to let that dry about 24 hours. And then I can put a couple more coats on there and I can buff or sand like with 600 grit between the coats and just make it as lustrous as I want. Now you notice if you're looking closely at this, this isn't a pendant yet, there's not a hole in there. Well, why didn't we drill the hole in there when we were cutting out that big blank of wood? Well, because if we put a hole in there right there, we're gonna be determining that that's where it's gonna hang from. So it doesn't matter. You know, if the figure in this piece, if we drilled the hole willy-nilly and put it right there, well, this might be hanging sideways. It might not be the angle you want. So once you get this finish completely done and you see which way you want to orient it, run over to your uh, drill press, put a small hole in it. Now this is where you become a jeweler. Uh, Bruce gets his stuff from Rio Grande Jewelry and it's an online jewelry supply store. They have thousands of things. And this little thing right here is called a bale, right? Well, what the bale does is it goes into that hole you drilled and this is silver, so you can actually do this by hand. You know, it's a little ink on my fingers too. I didn't get away from it free, free did I? But anyway, okay, the bales on there, that's really cool. He picked out a little clasp system which has a magnet on the end and the magnet goes through that hole. Trust me, it does. It's just my fingers won't work with it. Come on, push through there. <laughs> there it goes. And when he sells these uh, crafts fairs, he's only asking about 15 bucks for them. So he's got a couple dollars of materials in there. So it's a real simple project. And then the clasp goes together and holds it like that. So anyway, that's how you make a pendant. That's how you dye your wood and make it really pretty. So until the next time, keep turning. The American Beauty Tim uses was made by Robust Tools. All our lays have a seven year warranty. Our tool wrists feature a hardened rod on top. Lots of sizes to fit your lathe. Robust. Because the making matters. Thompson Lay Tools. Welcome to a new level of professional wood turning tools. Made by a wood turner for wood turners.